Hello and welcome from us. Uh, we're coming up a little later. Critics have claimed that benefit reforms would lead to homelessness, displacement and population shifts across the capital and outside of it. But what's the evidence so far? With me today, Greg Hands, a government whip and Conservative MP for Chelsea and Fulham, and Clive Efford, Labour MP for Eltham, who is also Shadow Minister for Sport. Welcome uh, to you both. Thank nice you. to see you. Uh, first, let's start with the news that London Underground will run weekend uh, services round the clock under plans that also involve, yes, ticket office closures and up to 750 job cuts. The night tube idea uh, will provide services on the Piccadilly, Victoria, Central, Jubilee and Northern lines, apparently from the autumn of 2015. But Transport for London said that every ticket office would also close by then, resulting in the job cuts. And the RMT union has responded saying it hasn't ruled out strike action in the run-up to Christmas over these uh, lethal cuts. What are your constituents going to say, Greg? Are they going well, to say they're worried about not having someone there? Actually, at Broadway my or constituency the... has got the highest percentage of tube users of any constituency in London and the South East. So right, I think well, my constituents will find it very, very good news overall. I think 24-hour tube on the weekends and Friday and Saturday night uh, will be popular. It's similar to what they have in New York City, uh, and I think will be good news. Um, I think in terms of the what happens in the stations, um, the closure of the ticket offices, the, all of the stations will still be staffed and all passengers will still be able to buy tickets at the station. So I think overall this is a very good package for passengers um, to increase passenger use. The stations will remain absolutely safe uh, as they are at the moment, fully staffed, and I think it's a very good innovation and I'm looking forward to coming in. Just, uh, you know, should have happened a long time ago, Clive Efford? Well, uh, uh, certainly op opening the tube overnight at the weekends has, has got to be welcome. But um, at the same time, 750 jobs going, uh, ticket offices closing. Uh, that's got to alarm people about safety issues on stations. So we, we're, there's a lot of detail here that we're going to have to look at because you know, losing those sorts of jobs when we're extending the time that the tube stations are going to be open, how does that all stack up? What does that mean in terms of unmanned trains? Is, is the technology there? What is, you know, how soon are we going to see all, the, all, all that technology in place that makes it safe for people travelling? There are lots of questions. Boris is very good at making these sorts of announcements long before the, the things are in place well, for these things to happen. But, and, and how can it add up, Greg Hatz? How can you lose 750? And that's the, the, the bottom estimate, if you like, at the moment of the jobs going as well as running a, a longer service, how can you lose those oh. jobs and keep that same level of security and safety at okay. every station? I think if you go into a tube station at the moment, Tim, like if you go into my local station, Fulham Broadway, uh, you'll always find uh, staff uh, sitting there uh, being available to, to, to give out tickets when asked for. Um, but I think most people these days, and this has been a technological change over the last few years, are now choosing to go to the machines because it's quicker and it's more efficient. So this is just about redeploying staff um, to make sure there's a much more efficient use uh, in a pro-passenger way to get a longer tube operating time, uh, which I think will be popular amongst tube users, particularly on my constituency on the district line. Uh, and people travelling into London, back out of London, it'll be safer overall. There'll be fewer people uh, fighting to get mini cabs home in the middle of the night. You won't get. Can I just say you won't get much? It doesn't really affect you. It doesn't have well, a bit of tube out there, does North it? North Greenwich is as far as it comes uh, for, mm. for for us in south, south east London, and uh, obviously we'd like to see. Uh, more of the uh, mass tra transportation systems extended into South East London. In that, that sense, we're the poor relations uh, of London. People talk and focus on the underground and, and assume it's a London-wide issue. But, mm. And it is. But, I mean, many of the people from my constituency will complete journeys or start journeys home using the London Underground. So it is important for them, but, but uh, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that parts of London are not directly served by it. OK, let's move on. Uh, it's one of the most potent charges made against uh, the government that its benefit reforms will lead to homelessness and hundreds of families being forced to move to the outskirts of the capital or away from it altogether. Some councils are certainly having to find extra resources already to deal with people needing temporary accommodation and so on. Across the capital, Andrew Cryan now looks at the evidence so far. We will not see and we will not accept any kind of Kosovo-style you know, social cleansing of London. You are not going to see... Uh, on my watch, you are not going to see thousands of families being evicted uh, from the place where they've been living and where they have put down roots. These comments, made by the mayor on BBC London back in 2010, proved controversial at the time. But have they also been proved right? According to London councils, in the 12 months leading up to June this year, 789 households were placed outside the capital, and some of those only on a temporary basis while accommodation in London was found. 
partly because there were lots of concerns raised by people like us that these things would start happening. The government provided some extra transitional money, which has seemed to kind of at least prevent local authorities from uh, sending people too far away in large numbers yet. But when that money begins to run out over the next year or so, who knows, we may see far more people being sent a very long way away from their jobs, from their children's schools and from their family networks. The London Borough of Bromley's Housing Advice Centre. More and more people are coming here homeless in need of the council's help. The government have always denied that their benefits reforms would cause homelessness, but on the ground in this conservative borough, they say their experience is different. Now, this week, Bromley are drawing a million pounds out of a special contingency fund to pay for more homelessness services this year. They say it's partly because the market has made properties more expensive, but also because of the government's welfare reforms. I think a lot of family units are still making do. Uh, Christmas and New Year, the pressures of Christmas and all the rest of it. I think we're, we always thought that the early part of next year would see the most telling information come through about how this was going to be managed in the way forward and the pressures that we'd have on homelessness and our, indeed our budgets here in the, in the borough. Mm. But you've already seen an increase as a result of welfare reform and you think in the new year it could yeah, be worse? The, the pressures that we're currently um, experiencing and hence the drawdown of a million pounds worth of contingency money is partly so certainly uh, as a result of welfare, welfare reforms. Other Conservative councils in London agree there is a link between changes to the benefit system and an increase in homelessness. Westminster are already on the record saying the two are related. In addition, Sunday Politics spoke to Croydon and Bexley. Both anticipate welfare reform will cause increased homelessness down the line. Kensington and Chelsea told us they've seen an increase since the changes kicked in. And here at the housing charity Shelter, more and more calls are being made to their homelessness helpline. Unfortunately, the numbers of people who are being put up in temporary accommodation, including families with children having to live in the worst kind of bed and breakfast accommodation because there's simply nowhere else for the local authority to put them, is just rising through the roof at the moment. And that means, unfortunately, that thousands of children are living in squalid conditions, having to share toilets uh, with up to 30 other people, you know, witnessing all sorts of unpleasant things in a grotty bed and breakfast environment. That's no way to raise kids, it's no, way, no place to spend Christmas Day with your family. So could it be that while so far welfare reform is yet to force the homeless from London in huge numbers, it may yet come to materialise? All Clive efforts, uh, it may not, and actually because of the interim arrangements which we heard talk of there and the extra money put in to take into account of individual circumstances, people are going to have time to adjust and get used to this. Well, no, the housing's not there for this. I mean, what's happening is that we're, you know, we're seeing people being in, impoverished by these austerity measures that have been taken and cuts in welfare, the welfare cap and the, uh, the bedroom tax. And we're seeing people being forced out of the communities that they've lived in for many, many years. And there just isn't the housing to rehouse these people, particularly in central London. And for a borough like Bromley in outer London, a wealthy borough like Bromley to be speaking in the way that they, ha they are instead of telling us the way that their welfare that uh, 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 measures are, are hitting into their budget just tells us that what we're seeing is the government claiming that they're making these savings in welfare, but actually they're dumping that 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 debt onto local authorities, Alarm local bells, council taxpayers. Well, I disagree. I mean, I think this is actually all about the housing benefit bill having gotten out of control under Labour. It doubled to 20 billion a year. There were housing benefit awards of up to 104,000 pounds per annum How many? to families How in many? my part of London. How many? Yeah, Hammersmith the Fulham, one of my local councils, has done a fantastic job with 540. 543 families in temporary accommodation uh, and only 10 of those families have been forced to move out of the borough. The remaining ones which have been affected by this cap, the council, and this is happening to councils across London, have been successful in negotiating a lower rent uh, from the private sector and that has actually been what it's all about. It's all been about trying to have a more effective system where people are housed in social housing or in temporary housing that's much more likely to be the size for their household, saving us money overall and very, very few people have been adversely affected in of the Fulham and elsewhere of having to move outside of London. So hats I think it's been a hats success. Off to them because you, you'd have to how do the same that, and get the down. Look, we, we know that f now 57% of households that are in poverty now in London are in working households. 
So it's not just a question of benefit that is leaving people behind. We know that 26% of households in London received housing benefit last year. So the idea that there is this downward pressure on the, on the wel wel welfare budget, what we saw for the housing benefit budget is soaring housing values and rents were going up. That's what was forcing it up. Yes, which and, is what, and we that's didn't the do, action we've taken we, is to I, reduce the private sector rent. I will hold my, ha my, my hand up and say the Labour, last Labour government, and you, you know, I criticised them at the time, did not build enough houses. But this government, under Boris Johnson, built fewer houses than we were building in the 1920s last year at a time when we've got a housing crisis. And that is what's behind, at the root cause of all this. Um, you know, it's one thing hearing that from Clive Efford, but Conservative model borough like Bromley having to dip in money to pay these things, your own or one of your own local boroughs, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea saying also it's having to spend a lot more money on homelessness and whatever. You can't argue with that, the can you? The discretionary housing payments are coming uh, partly from the government. So the government has sensibly said for transitional arrangements or special cases where there's anybody involving anybody disabled, uh, elderly, um, the armed forces, how long? Um, that discretionary housing payments you're, will but, uh, be available. Point, actually, but you're, you're, close, actually, you're close to the Chancellor. How long will these discretionary payments yeah, and this we'll fund be available? At the moment, we'll Tim, have to see. We'll have to see. At the moment, at the moment we haven't seen the we'll exodus from though, London that was predicted. And I say in Hammersmith of Fulham, only 10 of those 543 households have had to leave Hammersmith of Fulham, which has got one of the highest property prices in London. OK, so I think this idea of an exodus from London simply hasn't happened. Obviously, we need to keep a close attention on the situation. We have to make sure funds are available in difficult cases. We've exempted, as I say, the disabled, the elderly and so on. But this is all about reforming the benefit system. So we've got a system that is long term affordable for this country, which was not the case under the last Labour government. And so it will be you, painful and there will be readjustments. And but that's the reality of our city benefits. now, isn't it? Look, 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 it's not a question of unlimited benefits. You want it's unlimited a benefits. It's a, flight, question, yeah? it's a question of Can't fairness. Afford it. I can give you an example of, of a constituent of mine a single mother with children on the benefit cap, the council has just had to accept she will never be able to pay all her rent because feeding and clothing her children and paying all her, 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 her other bills means she will just never have enough money. And that is what is going on in London at the moment. We, are, we, we had austerity, we had the debt that was nationalised when we saved the banking system, which was, you know, don't dispute, we needed to do that. But that debt is now being lumped on the poorest people in our communities. Quick last word on that, come back on that. Quick last word. Well, I, I think the figures speak for themselves. Actually, there hasn't been this exodus from London. It's a problem that has needed to be sorted out for some time. The government has taken action. The people supporters, the benefit bill have gotten too high. And so long as we protect the vulnerable, the public want to see that Although, benefit bill come down. Although, of course, we'll probably have to return. We will be returning by having a look once the full kind of universal cap and universal benefit has been introduced. But anyway, thanks Build more affordable housing. For that. Now, the mayor and the Met Police have been challenged this week over the number of unsolved crimes in London. Labour say uh, its research shows that fewer crimes are being solved now than when Boris Johnson took up office five years ago, as Steve Tolley reports. There are 3,000 fewer police officers in London now than three years ago. The Met's budget has been cut by around a quarter. But despite all this, crime in London is falling. So are the effects of the squeeze being felt elsewhere? Well, according to Labour on the London Assembly, it's leading to a fall in the number of cases being solved. This week, they published research claiming that only 21% of crimes in London last year ended up with an official sanction, meaning a suspect being charged, cautioned or given some other kind of warning. That's down from 26% in 2008. In Haringey, for example, one of my boroughs, there's been a 10% drop in solved crime. In Camden, an 11% drop. In <coughs> 12%. Kensington and Chelsea, 11% drop. We see performance sliding, um, and I think that can only be an indication that um, the police cuts have actually gone too far. That actually the police force is so stretched now that it's not able to do the job that Londoners want it to do. Mayor Boris Johnson told City Hall this week that the fall is down to a focus on charging suspects and taking them to court, as opposed to issuing cautions and fixed penalty notices where suspects automatically accept guilt. We've set a target for sanction detections <coughs> uh, with, the, um, uh, with the police and uh, we, are, we, are, we are working, we are, we, what we want is to see an improvement in, in sanction detection. But with the Met having less staff and less money, that might be a big ask. Boris Johnson will be hoping his reforms don't stretch the thin blue line too far. Steve Tolley reporting. And Marion Fitzgerald, um, criminologist from the University of Kent, joins us. Welcome to you. Hello. Um, uh, what's happening here? Is, is this something? Is this a, a, an alarming trend and something that's happening 
differently here in London than elsewhere in the country? Well, the peak of 26% in 2008 to 9 uh, was also a peak nationally. I mean, you've got to remember that the police were put under the cosh uh, by the previous government to get their detection rates up. Uh, in the Met, they were about 13% 10 years ago, and nationally they were 18%. By 2008 to 9, they had miraculously doubled in London. They got up to 26%, which is a figure that's being quoted. Uh, nationally, they'd gone up by 18%. To, a, to, a, to an unsustainable rate, you're saying. So where you, you're saying that where they're finding themselves well, now is more where... Um, you, you know, the, the, the rise in London was much sharper than elsewhere, but everyone was trying to make sure they got their detection rates up. And I, I don't think... The public fully understands they think the detection means someone being caught charged with an offence taken to court mm. now according to the home office definition it's not just people being charged and taken to court you can also count uh, despite uh, uh, cannabis warnings mm. uh, penalty notices for disorder uh, Offences taken into consideration, someone who's been... What are you saying here, that you can actually, by using those, you can actually boost your figures yeah. quite easily? And actually, it, what's quite interesting, I just looked at the figures for 2008 to 9, and even nationally, the use of cannabis warnings was about 8% of... It accounted for all of that a huge increase. Right, so, in, yeah. so, so, now, that has been reined back. Right. It hasn't gone back down as far in the Met as, as elsewhere. Um... What's happened since 2008 to 9 is that nationally the figure has gone down to 27% and it's stabilised at that. In the Met it went down from 26% to 24%. The last two years it's been down to 22%. And the reason for the drop in the last two years, I looked at the figures, is not that they are charging more people. That's actually dropped from 13% to 12%. Right. But they have also dropped off their, their use of cannabis warnings by 1%, and that accounts so, for the further... So it's possible to say that this might be a much more accurate assessment now as to what, how, how, how good or bad policing is. Can it, what about the figure, though, itself, that one in five only of, of crimes is being solved? I mean... Yeah, but if you think about it nationally, I mean, that's not putting it in context. Um, well, London is, still, has, London is worse than other London cities as well. Why is it so bad? Why is it not worse? Um, well, actually, if you compare it with, say, the West Midlands, I compared it with West Midlands and Greater Manchester over the years. Greater Manchester has always been streets ahead, but, of course, we've got the Public Administration Committee currently looking at whether the crime figures are fiddled and finding that massively they are. So they are. everything here has to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt, especially the best figures, OK? But all throughout the years, I mean, David Blunkett came in, he said, this is a disgrace, you know, that, that um, detection rates have plummeted to this extent since the heyday of 1980. Well, of course, after 1980, you got the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which stopped people fitting people up. And so you got a drop then. A drop then. They had started, they had started Quick. to rise. Yep. Blunkett puts everyone under the cosh. People start sort of getting nervous and looking around for ways of making the figures look better. So lots of competition starts yes. at that point. They're then given targets from 2004 and we see it go up. We see it go up massively in the event. But if you look over the years... Very quick, because I just want to get a reaction from my guests. You've given us a lots to think about. Right. <laughs> if you look... You know, blanket took this 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 blanket this blanket blanket rate, um, and and the overall drop. If you compare forces, you always find that the urban forces have lower detection rates Good. than rural forces. Always, and absolutely. London On that always note, I want to know from you. Behind. I want to know from you, uh, uh, Greg Hands. Uh, obviously, and crime's coming down impressively in London, though, like it is <clears> everywhere <throat> else in the country. Um, but will it continue to? And will they continue to be able to solve crimes? with the cuts, obviously, that, are, that continue to come to the police force? Well, uh, two things on that, Tim. You're right, crime is coming down. It's coming down very, very quickly indeed. In fact, the rate that crime is coming down in London is as fast in the last 18 months as it was in the previous 10 years. So not only is crime coming down, it's coming down much faster. Secondly, the number of bobbies are out there on the beat fighting crime on the front line is more or less the same. There has been a reduction in police stations and, and staff, uh, staffing police stations, uh, which has been part of Boris and Mopac and Stephen I Greenhalgh's reforms. Yes. And that has seen through to actually the crime detection rate it, it very, it's more or less flat line. Clive, it hasn't actually respond changed. to that? There are 2,800 less poli p police constables in London since 2010. There are, if you take uh, community support offices into consideration, 4,000 less. 
Um, they have decimated safer neighbourhood teams, which everyone across London accepted were a big success. The big success about safer neighbourhood teams is that they were dedicated to their local ward. They had good local knowledge about clearing up, particularly those really minor irritating crimes for local well, communicators. Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's very, been very briefly, very briefly. In, my, in my area, safer neighbourhood teams have not been decimated. And actually, the story of, of police reform in the last couple of years has been getting police out of stations uh, and onto the okay. beat and onto the street fighting you, crime, you're, you're really not filling in force. I need to say to you at this stage, thanks so much. You're giving us a lot to think about. Can't ask you to share any more with us at this stage, but thanks very much indeed for coming in. Uh, it's time for the rest of the political news in 60 seconds. The House of Lords Select Committee report into the London 2012 Olympics has warned that a robust legacy from the Games is in jeopardy. The report finds little evidence of increased participation in sport and highlights the uneven distribution of economic benefits of the Games across the UK. A bridge over the Thames, which would be shared by pedestrians and cyclists, has been given planning permission. The bridge would link Battersea and Chelsea Harbour. It has been given the go-ahead by Wandsworth Council and Hammersmith and Fulham Council. The Greater London Authority must still give final consent. Crossrail's first completed tunnel has been unveiled, marking a key milestone for Europe's largest infrastructure project. The 4.25-mile journey from Royal Oak to Farringdon took 18 months to build. Boris Johnson has insisted that cycling safety has improved in the last few years despite a recent spate of cycling fatalities on London's roads. The Mayor of London told the London Assembly that he would not be deflected from the cause of encouraging more cycling in London. Greg, it's been, it's been a tough couple of weeks for him on, uh, on this you know, policy and concerns about cycling and these accidents. Um, are you more worried now about safety here? We even had the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, no less, saying he wouldn't cycle. Well, I think it's actually been helpful, the amount of attention that's been given um, to the issue. But I think the figures suggest the number of people dying um, on cycles uh, has not increased. Seriously injured, remember, but, the or, big figure okay, we want to look uh, at as is as a seriously I'm aware, injured the figure. figures are not showing that, no, but I do injured. think as, a, as an issue, and trying to make London more cycle-friendly and getting more people cycling, and those two things are, are linked, strongly connected, mm. I think it's been good to have that attention. Right, so you're happy but with that, very in a sense, it's drawn that to cases. attention. Absolutely. And I think Clark. Boris, as we know, is very, very keen on cycling, and Boris has done a huge amount. Absolutely, and very unfortunate that this has happened as a spike, but he is trying to promote and change people's attitude to We've, cycling. If, if we're going to solve the, the congestion problems and all the problems we have on our roads in London, we are going to have to make more efficient use of the road space and cycling's got to be a key part of that. So yes, Boris is right, but you know, the Mayor is right to try uh, to uh, facilitate more uh, uh, cycle lanes in London. But the painting a blue line down the side of a major road is, I, I, is not the solution. And I think we need to, be, to start to think about being more radical and getting uh, some space that is completely separated from, uh, from vehicle traffic so that we okay. can really encourage those people gotta, who want to cycle. Got to finish there. Uh, thanks very much indeed. We will, of course, be returning to this one. Um, Andrew, it's back to you.